Israel's massive expansion of illegal settlements built on stolen land and demolished Palestinian homes is advanced by extreme violence from both the state forces and the settlers. But the attacks on innocent Palestinians by Israeli settlers goes far beyond fists and rocks. Among the most shocking is a 2015 arson attack in the small village of Duma, which took the lives of Reham Dawabsha, her husband Saeed, and their one-year-old baby boy, Ali. The only survivor, seven-year-old Ahmed, who teetered on the edge of death for weeks, with burns over 70% of his body. A group of extremists from a settlement nearby, who conduct regular attacks on Duma, came into the village late at night. They firebombed the home, with the family asleep inside. According to witnesses, Saeed and Reham fled from the home and collapsed outside, engulfed in flames. The settlers then stood over their bodies and doused them with kerosene as they burned alive. The settlers spray-painted, Long live the Messiah King, on the charred home. The infant baby, Ollie, was dead at the scene. The rest of the family survived the initial attack, horrifically burned. Syed Dawapsha went next, after clinging to life for a week. He was only 32 years old. Reham went last. She managed to survive for over a month in the hospital. She died on her 26th birthday, September 6th. On the very same day a year later, I interviewed her father and caretaker of Ahmed, the lone survivor of the brutal attack. وأحمد الأم والأب وأسف الأم والأب وأحمد معهم كمان ثلاثة يعني وعلي سألت عن علي وين علي قالوا علي ما ما رضينا نسافر ظل في جوا النار خد سيارة وتوجهت نحس نحو المستشفى اللي هو مستشفى رفيديا أحمد وصل قبل الأم وأبوه المستشفى لما أنا وصلت كان وصلت الأم والأب أنا شفت المنظر كشعر بدني لما شفت اللحم متنافر منهم يعني محروقين على الآخر لحمهم قاعد يكت على الأرض جنزي أنا سمعت الهام هي تقول نيموني نيمون إيه أس بدي مية بدي مية وسعد كان يقول نيموني نيموني أحمد وأمه دخلوا عملية تقريبا في نفس الوقت في شفرقية بينهم ساعة عملية اللي هي عملية كل زرع الجلد أحمد كان في عنده نسبة إنه يأخذ منه أما رهام ما كان في عندها فأخذوا لهم بنك الجلد العملية عند أحمد كانت ناجحة بس كانت عند الأم العكس يعني ما كانت سيئة جدا مسكت معها أحمد خضع تقريبا لها 15 عملية في نفس اليوم اللي توفت اللي هو اليوم زي اليوم هذا بالضبط إحنا اللي إحنا فيه توفت الاستشهدة لهام الساعة تقريبا 12 و 10 دقائق في الليل أنا رحت عندها أنا كقعدت عندها تقريبا ساعة بعدين أرغموني على أنهم يخرجوا على الثلاجة فأنا أرجعت لأحمد الممرضين والمرضات اللي هناك قالوا لي أحمد بحاجتك فعلا رجعت لأحمد وكانت الدموع معبي عيني أحمد نظر إلي وشافني قال لي أنت ليش تبكي فقلت له لا يمكن طاحت وسخة في عيني فقال لي هات أنا بشيل الوسخة فقلت له لا أنا بروح على الحمام وبغسل وبرجع ورجعت عند أحمد ووقت لغاية الساعة ستة الصبح سبعة الصبح وأنا صاحي وأنا أضحك مع أحمد رغم إن اللي صار معي ما بدي أحمد ينتكس ويرجع له للخلف أنا حبيت إنه يكون للأمام رغم إني أنا فقط عزمة عندي زهرة قلبي يعني اللي هي أم أحمد وأنا ظليت عند أحمد سنة كاملة وحنا في المستشفى 24 ساعة ما ما أتركه طوى الله طوى الله عنده وصرت أنا بالنسبة له يعني الأم والأب والأخ والعم والخال كل شيء حياته إيه إحمد بيعملش إشي بدون ما أنا أعمل إياه 
بصير لنا كان صير لنا محكمات واحد في المستشفى فطلبت منه اني اروح المحكمه وخلى لا لا تروح بلاش يعملوا فيك زي ما عملوا في امي وابوي ضربوهم بديش يضربوك انت كمان كان بتخوف كثير منهم بخاف منهم كثير يعني وبيضل مشتاق للجنه وبده يروح الجنه وانت بدنا نروح الجنه بسال عن الجنه كثير بديك تصير الجنه كثير انا بدي اروح عند امي يعني كثير بسال عن امه والوقت الحاضر بيسال شوي خفيف يعني بس احمد مش من الناس اللي لسانه بيقعد يحكي العينين اللي بحكي العينين اللي بتكلموا العينين اللي بيسالوني انا بشوف احمد انه كل ما يطلع علي بيسالني وين امي وين ابوي لاني انا لما بعمل اي شيء لاحمد احمد بصير حبب في يبوظ في حتى قال لي يعني انت اغلى من من نفسي انا بحبك اكثر من حالي Despite many witnesses and Israeli forces knowing full well who the attackers were, they made no arrests in the terrorist attack. Instead, they issued a gag order, making it illegal for any media to report on the incident. The press embargo lasted months. But the attack became a major public scandal, and the Israeli state was pressured to file charges after more than five months. Of the 17 they initially arrested in connection with the attack, only two were charged by the Israeli government. Outrageously, just one of them, Amiram Ben Ulil, was charged with murder. The other was charged as an accessory and barred from being held in prison because, according to the court, was too young and the experience would be too stressful for him. He was 17 years old. They even released, without charges, Mir Edinger, considered a leader of the terrorist movement and the Dewapsha murders, well known for advocating and even giving detailed instructions for arson attacks on sleeping Palestinian families. Ben Ulil is still awaiting trial, always in good spirits, because he knows the system is tilted far in his favor. Endless legal delays keep him safe at home. The nightmare for this family is not over. The very same people who took part in this attack still terrorize the village, and Ahmed in particular. Supporters of the attack often demonstrate outside the court proceedings, celebrating the murderers as heroes. They hold up three fingers, one for every person who died in the attack. But they also hold rallies at the entrance to Duma itself, taunting Ahmed and his grandfather, promising to come back and finish the job. Months after the attack, video surfaced of a settler wedding in Jerusalem, where attendees brandished rifles, knives, and even Molotov cocktails, cheering the murder of the Dewapsha family. They held a large picture of the infant Ali Dewapsha and stabbed it with a knife as they danced. Ahmed's grandfather showed me the few safety measures they can take. Cages on the windows of Ahmed's room, so another firebomb can't be thrown inside. But they have no other form of self-defense. They're not allowed to have weapons, and the Israeli military is notorious for turning a blind eye to settler attacks. He described the utter terror of living under the shadow of these settlers, the people who killed his daughter, his son-in-law, and his infant grandson, boldly vowing to attack them again. احمد بكره راح راح يكون يعني زي امه وابوه زي ما هم ارهابيين احمد راح يكون ارهابي زيهم فانه لازم احمد الاحسن انه احمد يتخلصوا منه عملوا رهام معلمه مدرسه كانت تربي اجيال عملوها ارهابيه سعد كان يشتغل في في البناء عملوا ارهابي علي الصغير اللي عمره سنه ونص حكوا عنه ارهابي اي بيجوا اول اول ما بيجوا بيجوا بيقول عنا انتم ارهابيه انتم قتلاء انتم لازم لازم تموتوا ما لكم ارض هان صاروا هم صحابين الارض احنا ما لناش ارض اول ما بيجوا بيقولوا لنا علي هو اخو احمد وين هو؟ رهام وين؟ سعد وين؟ واحمد لازم يلحق اهله فاشروا لنا كمان بالاشاره هي ثلاثه انه حركنا عندكم ثلاثه واحنا مش سالين عنكم مش خايفين منكم ليش اللي مش سالين عنه مش خايفين لانه الحكومه بتدعمهم الحكومه حميتهم والحكومه بتمدهم في جميع انواع الاسلحه انه تفضلوا اعملوا اللي بدكم اياه معطيتهم الصلاحيه انهم يقتلوا Ahmed has many more skin grafting surgeries to go already with the challenge of surviving such a traumatic event and with the killers of his mother father and brother primed to attack it's a struggle for everyone around him to live a normal life 
The Israeli government has sought to explain away this case as simply an isolated incident, but nothing could be further from the truth. According to the Arab League, there were over 11,000 settler attacks on Palestinians in the West Bank in 2015 alone. It is a very rare occurrence for charges to be filed on the attackers. The Israeli military, courts, and politicians simply give aid, cover, and protection to the spearhead of Israeli expansion. They're extremist settlers. This kind of harassment and settler terror against Palestinians is not just happening in rural villages. It's institutionalized in some of its biggest cities. I'm in Hebron, the largest remaining Palestinian city. In 1968, Israeli settlers occupied a hotel here and never left, beginning the colonial settlement. Today, a couple hundred of the most ideologically extreme Zionists have staked claim to the heart of the old city. Although their numbers are relatively small compared to the hundreds of thousands of Palestinians surrounding them, the settlers here are protected by looming guard towers, militarized checkpoints, and about 1,500 Israeli soldiers, and one of the most emblematic examples of Israeli apartheid. Hebron, one of the oldest cities in the world, is divided into two parts, known as H1 and H2. H2 is completely under Israeli military control. About 120,000 Palestinians live in H1. About 35,000 Palestinians and 700 Israeli settlers live in H2. You cannot travel freely between the areas. Here, in one of the main commercial and historical cities in all of Palestine, the same practice of kicking the residents out of their homes for Israeli settlers rages on. Again, this growing settlement and military occupation is illegal under international law. Still a major commercial hub, the old city of Hebron's windy streets are bustling with vendors and packed with shops. But as we walked through the old bazaars, the architecture of oppression was palpable. Above our heads, throughout the entire area, are steel cages to block the trash that's constantly thrown from the settlers who live above the Palestinian stores and homes. Everything from rotted food to dirty diapers littered the top of the cage and lay in piles between the barricades of barbed wire. Dystopian guard towers loom over the caged neighborhood. Everywhere you go, you're being watched by an Israeli soldier. Any Palestinian going about their daily life is subject to constant harassment and indiscriminate violence. I spoke with resident and shop owner Eid Sadir about his experience living here. يعني بنحسهم انهم بقتلونا يعني بالاساس اول ما بلشنا بلشنا في حياتي انا حياتي تعرضت للخطر سحبت حالي كانت اجتياحات منطقه عسكريه مغلقه طبعا اكل فيش كان في البيوت حياه صعبه فانا سحبت حالي رحت لل للمحلات عشان اشري اكلي وايش زي هيك شافني الجندي اللي واقف على النقطه هون اول ما اطلق علي اطلق علي الجيش رصاصه اجت جنب القلب مباشره طبعا الرصاصه موجوده لحتى الان عند القلب من قامت هذه الرصاصه طبعا قعدت ثلاث شهور في العنايه المركزه وتعالجت فيما بعد رجعت لبيتي بعد فترة كانت زوجتي تطلع على السطوح تشوف الخزانات المي لأنه ما في مية فمستوطة من وراء البيت أطلق عليها النار في الراس مباشرة أطلق عليها خمس رصاصات فاستشهدت على المحل فكانت حياتها منتهية فكانت المرة حامل لما رحنا على المستشفى الولد ما كان ميت الدكتور أطلعوا حي وسحبنا حالنا عالجنا علاجنا حالنا يعني في الولد اللي طلع لنا بدل امه واخذناه للبيت وعدت بلا زوجه لفتره معينه لاني كنت حزين ويأسان وسحبت حالي يعني بعديها بفتره قصيره ابني طايح من هون بدي اروح على الدكان نشري حلويات اشياء زي هيك فمستوطن من هون من فوق خبطه ماده حارقه في عينيه فقد فيها بصره فبطل يشوف بعينه فسحبنا حالنا وديناه لعدة مرات للأردن علاجه وعملنا له عمليات في عينيه فلقيت يعني بيشوف نسبة قليلة في العينين فلقيت قاعدين الساعة ماشيين بعلاجه الأشياء الثانية في العياد اللي هي العيادة الإسرائيلية اللي هي عياد المسخرة وعياد العرش وزي هيك المستوطنين بيشربوا الخمور والكحول وليش زي هيك بعد ما يشربوها بيلتقونا إياها 
فبنت اخي كمان كانت قاعدة على الشباك طفلة صغيرة عمرها ثلاث سنوات هذيك الايام فلما خبطوها عينة الخمر فتحت وجهها من هون فبطلت يعني قعدنا فترة بيجي حوالي شهرين وهي عينها مش مفتحة وزي ما انتم شايفين يعني محلات عندنا مسكرة البيوت الشبابيك عندنا مسكرة فيش عندنا منفس فحياتنا صعبة كلها Residents here must endure a series of dehumanizing checkpoints to simply navigate through town. Many people who live between areas have to use these checkpoints to go to school or work, which can hold them up for hours. The Empire Files obtained hidden camera footage of one of the main city gates. I met with Muhannad Kafisha, a guide to Hebron's old city, who explained how the apartheid system in Hebron has impacted his community. Uh, it takes somebody, for example, three hours just to enter the, the checkpoint because so many people go there to enter. And also, like, in, in, inside of the room to be checked and then uh, check your ID and your number, it takes at least from 20 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And you can have a guess or, like, you can see, like, if you have 20 people who want to enter. Number 20 is going to wait for maybe six hours just to enter to his house. And you were talking about building materials, how it could take up to 15 years to even fix your home. Yeah, if you need to do anything inside of that area, if you want to bring uh, forks or spoons or anything to your house, you will need to get a permission, especially if you want to, re to fix your house or to rebuild your house. Palestinians are not allowed to build. If you want to fix your kitchen, you will need to ask a, for a permission from the Israeli civil administration and I know a family who wanted to, to fix their kitchen. It took them 15 years to get the permission. It was from 2000, they took it at 2015, they started working at 2015. They stopped them after a few, a few, few days of working there and they told them you're not allowed to work even if they had a permission. The complete lockdown of Hebron was dramatically increased, not in response to attacks by Palestinians, but in response to an attack on Palestinians. In 1994, an Israeli-American-born settler massacred 29 Muslims praying in the Ibrahimi Mosque in the heart of the old city. As a result, Israeli authorities collectively punished Palestinians, restricting their freedoms even further in the name of security. When the massacre happened in the Ibrahimi Mosque, when 29 Palestinians were killed, more than 170 Palestinians were injured by, uh, and the massacre was committed by an Israeli extreme settler who was originally from Brooklyn. After the massacre, as Palestinians, as victims, we were punished for this. And uh, we were like punished for something that we didn't do, for something happened to us. So they closed the mosque, they closed the area, they closed 1,800 shops, they closed the street, the main street in Hebron, all the markets. Everything used to be active in the area, they closed it, just to occupy the area. When they want to do anything, they say for security reasons. For example, when, they, when the massacre happened and when they closed the whole of the area, they said for security reasons, because Palestinians might revenge. So they just stopped, they just said, said that and they closed the whole of the area. And when the military say for security reason, nobody can negotiate or talk about it. Even when they kill somebody, they say for security reason. But what is the definition of security reason in their view? You don't know. When the city was divided, its population was torn apart. The 700 or so settlers living in the area that they seized from Palestinians turned a once buzzing cultural hive into the ghost town you see today. The main commercial thoroughfare was barred from Palestinian use. And since 1994, nearly half the shops in H2 have gone out of business. The economy in H2 is decimated, with 75% of residents living below the poverty line. The Palestinian population continues to decline, 
The area was so empty that the only people I saw were groups of soldiers. Now, now, now in Shahada Street, there is still maybe 10 families living there. Yeah, it, there used to be maybe 100 or 100, 150 families living inside, inside the street. Uh, most of people left their houses because of the curfew, because of the difficult situation. After 1994, they said, we will come back. But when they came back to their houses, they found their houses are taken. So now when people want to go out of their houses inside of H2 areas or in Shahada Street, they don't go all. They keep somebody in the house to protect the house because the settlers will come, take it, put military watching tower on the top of it, and they just will control it easily. And if they, if you complain, they will just go to their court, which is Israeli court, and then they decide the house belongs to the settlers. And if someone needs medical attention from within that compound, what happens? If you call an ambulance, if you live in H2, you won't get an ambulance because ambulances are not allowed to enter there. Even you're not allowed to have visitors. So you have to, ca you have to carry the body of this person out of this, outside the checkpoint and then take this person to the hospital. And, and there is one Palestinian in, in, in November or in, in December, he, was, he died. Uh, he had a heart attack because the ambulance couldn't reach his house because the soldiers refused to let the ambulance in H2 area. He just passed away. The, I saw the ambulance coming to take him, and I went to the soldiers talking to them in Hebrew, asking them to open the gate. And the, so one of the soldiers was smiling, and he said, no. I told him, can you just call your commander? And he said, no. I know two people passed away because of uh, this. But me, people were killed. Uh, recently, like four of my friends were killed by the Israeli soldiers' guns. This one is called Baruch Marzal, and he's a lawmaker in Israel. And he was in the Israeli ele elections twice, in the parliament elections. He lost it twice. So when somebody gets killed, I mean Palestinian, by the soldiers or the settlers, they, they bring pizza, they bring sweets, juice, and they start, giving, they start giving food to all the settlers and sweets, celebrating the death of this Palestinian. And that is not a rare occurrence. According to Human Rights Watch, Israeli soldiers often kill civilians by firing randomly into their neighborhoods. But sometimes the killing is much more direct. I'm standing where Abdel Fattah al-Sharif was executed on a video while laying on the ground wounded. The family who filmed it, who live right behind me, told me they've gotten regular death threats from soldiers and settlers ever since. As seen in the video, Abdul was summarily executed as he lay dying by Israeli soldier Elo Azaria. He was on the ground wounded a full three minutes before Azaria decided to casually walk back to him and shoot him in the head. Because of the viral video of the incident, the Israeli government was pressured to put him on house arrest awaiting a trial. Israelis condemn this modicum of punishment. Today, he is widely considered a hero in Israeli society. Mass rallies are held in support of him across Israel. Am Israel When I visited the occupied area of Hebron, I was immediately confronted by settler children who were hanging out with the soldiers just steps away from where the murder took place. I think What do you guys think of Elor Azaria? Elor Azaria? Good man. Good man? Yeah. You think it's good? It's a good thing to yes. shoot an Arab in the head? Yeah. yeah. Do you want to shoot an Arab in the head? Yeah. yeah. The execution by El Azaria is only known about because it was caught on film. Shooting Palestinians to death is commonplace. In 2015, over 115 Palestinians were shot and killed by Israeli forces in the West Bank. Over 75 Palestinians have met that same fate in 2016. From the rural countryside in Duma to the urban center of Hebron, this act of taking over Palestinian homes for illegal settlements is part of the same Israeli state project of ethnically cleansing and seizing all of the land. It's a path that has marched forward for the past century. The Israeli government is not just turning a blind eye to the worst kinds of violence against Palestinians living under the shadow of settlers. 
they are actively supporting the illegal expansion. Despite fake condemnations by the U.S. government, this situation is only possible with the vast financial and military support from the U.S. Empire. Every rifle, every home demolition, every innocent life taken is paid for by the U.S. taxpayer. As Palestinians defend their right to exist against increasing Israeli extremism, both from the government and settlers, the people of the U.S. must demand that these crimes are not done in their name. <laughs> <laughs>